Welcome back to The Breakfast here on PLOS TV Africa. Now let's uh, quickly get straight to uh, the newspapers and see what stories we can share with you this morning. We're going to be joined by Mr. Tunde Kolawole to, of course, uh, have his thoughts on these papers uh, out there. We'll start with the daily independent newspapers this morning. It's going to be on your screen in just a few seconds, yes. It says uh, um, on the daily independent uh, this morning... Okay, well, I think I have a different one. It's, uh, it says, um, lubricants import hits $500 million, hikes maintenance costs by 300%. Um, I think we have a, a wrong paper on the screen this morning. We're going to have to fix that, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep it going. Also on the daily, oh, I beg your pardon. Actually, I'm the one who's making a mistake here. Uh, still on the Daily Independent, banks hedge against lending over assets uh, quality concerns. COVID-19, scant inspectors scuttle a Green Africa inaugural flight. Also anxiety intrigues in APC as national uh, convention date remains uncertain. You can't stop amendment of constitution. PDP warns Buhari, cautions him on warfare uh, resources. Arrogant dictatorial remarks, that's also on the Daily Independent this morning. His position confirms his sectional president, says Pandev. Also, EFCC goes after open, or, or rather, Ogun State Assembly. Police repel attack on stations, kill 14 bandits in Benue. Federal government borrowings okay. Second Niger Bridge will be ready next year, says uh, 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 Fashola. And I think those are the ones that we can share this morning on the Daily Independent. Moving on now to the Punch newspaper. States cry for cops. Bandits change. Strategies. Attack schools in mass. 130 secondary schools in 130 secondary schools in Zamfara deserted communities shot. 315 secondary schools in Kebi lack security, says NUT chairman. Sheikh Gumi says no school safe until government negotiates with bandits. Above the headline on the punch, recapitalization, insurance industry assets rise to 2.02 trillion naira. Twitter usage, Sarap Suz Buhari lie alleges um, federal government curtailing free speech. FG spent uh, that $5 billion fighting poverty in five years. That's according to the minister. Media bills, Buhari National Assembly attempting to criminalize journalism, says ICPC. FG plans action as varsity workers threaten crisis over staff schools. Power distributors get CBN loans to tackle funding problem. Also on the Punch newspaper, NDLEA arrests security agents selling drugs to undergraduates and cultists. AFCC demands Ogun Assembly financial records, probes alleged fraud. Also, Oshun clears 1,023 hectares for cocoa, cassava, tomato cultivation. Police intensify search for Super TV CEO's killers block accounts. Jam blames NIN requirement as revenue drops to 5.8 billion naira. And lastly, on the Punch newspaper, APC fixes convention for October crisis in states persist all right moving on to the daily sun newspapers this morning second niger bridge 2022 completion date remains says the federal government capital market cp issuance hits 3.5 trillion naira as scarcity of ipos persist buhari under fire afenifere pandef nef ohaneze mbf and others attack president of a position on restructuring Information he has uh, responsible for his comments, says the ACF. And the PDP calls for restructuring, not synonymous with warfare. Also, Buhari meets Ngige and Gambari over insecurity in the southeast. Kaigama says, our boat sinking. Nigerian refugees in Niger, Chad and Cameroon rises to 312,069. Also, security beef up in worry as Olu of Worry's burial rights begin. Federal government, Lai Mohammed sued over directive to broadcasters to stop using Twitter. And NDLE in NAB's law enforcement officer and six others for dealing in cocaine and others. Those are the stories of the Daily Sound this morning. We're going to quickly go to uh, Mr. Tunde Kolawole 
uh, this morning. Thanks for joining us once again, sir. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure always being with you. All right, I'm going to start, let's start with the um, uh, Serap suing uh, the Nigerian government and Lai Mohamed over its ban on Twitter and how it affects broadcasters. It's not the first time that we're seeing a, a lawsuit by Serap against the federal government. How do you think this one might turn out? Mr. Kola, will you can you hear us? No, can you repeat that, please? I can't quite get it. Okay, I'm asking about the, the story concerning Serap suing the federal government and uh, Lai Mohammed uh, concerning its uh, ban on Twitter in Nigeria. Well, I, I think that is the appropriate thing to do. Uh, free speech is a very, very sacrosanct, not just uh, for the well being of the society, but also for the democracy that um, we are practicing. And if you also look at um, all the conventions around the world, whether the United Nations Charter on uh, People's Rights, the African Charter on Women and People's Rights, the West African Protocol, I mean the Equals Protocol, and then the Nigerian Constitution, it provides for free speech. And uh, you and I will remember what one American president said that if you were to choose between a society without a government or with a viable newspaper or media industry, you would prefer to have a media industry, I mean a media society without a, a government. That tells us how important free speech is to all society. So, when a government or a group of people decides to take away people's free speech, uh, it shouldn't be tolerated, uh, rather than um, engaging in this FF, uh, court is the appropriate place to settle issues like this. I have a feeling, just like we have had in the federal of cases, that our courts will rule in favor of a setup. But when you look at most uh, uh, decisions of the Court of Appeal, Supreme Court, and even of the Federal Court in the past. It has always been in favor of um, free speech. Furthermore, and more importantly, we need to reemphasize that uh, the closing down or even deleting a section of a, a politician's uh, uh, tweet or of the president's uh, tweet should not be equated and should not be synonymous with the rights of 200 million Nigerian people to have access to Twitter. For God's sake, we are no longer in the Bourbon age or in the age of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte of France, in which uh, Napoleon was a fat and peace state. I am the state. It is whatever I want that my citizens get. So I encourage the Senate to pursue this to a logical conclusion. For the well-being, welfare, and good governance of uh, this uh, uh, society. Without free speech, you can have uh, a free society. All right. Okay, Mr. Kalawale, on the Punch newspaper, we're seeing very, you know, grim statistics regarding, um, you know, the security situation in Nigeria. It says states cry for cops and bandits change uh, strategies. And uh, talking about how bandits change strategies and attack schools, saying 130 schools in Zamfara State and, uh, you know, deserted communities shot 315 secondary schools in Kebi lack security. And Chigumi here advocating for a negotiation with bandits, saying that until that is done, no school would be safe. Um, what do you think about these, you know, insecurity challenges regarding schools in the north? And uh, how do you tie that to that Biniyori um, school abduction in Kebi State, where five were released and one, you know, one uh, was killed over the weekend? Well, each time I hear a school being attacked and children being cut the wheel, added the wheel like cattle, my heart uh, uh, bleeds. I have said it times without number and will continue to repeat it that there is no justification whatsoever why bandits, kidnappers, should have the easy access that they do have to our school. 
by now we know the modus operandi of those who go to schools to kidnap a children. And if we know the modus operandi, we also have been able to to, to prepare a blueprint to, 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 to counter them. For times without number, we wait until this incident happens and then begin to shed crocodile tears over the uh, taking away of these uh, children. And the truth of the matter also is that uh, what is happening to the schools in the north has very, very serious implications for the stability of the country. You and I will remember that an organization like, uh, uh, I mean, Pokwara uh, have said that they don't want uh, any Western education in northern Nigeria. So this may be uh, one of the ways and means by which those who don't want Western education in northern Nigeria want to achieve it. Because if time children go to school and they get kidnapped, by the time they are recovered and the school resumes, you will never be able to find the full complement of the children who were schooling in those uh, and schools or in those places. Some will be too afraid or traumatized to go back to school. Some parents will withdraw their children because, I mean, for the safety of their lives and all that. And for that reason, we should, we should put in place almost a perfect or a security proof condition for our children to be able to go to school very, very safely. With regards to the high level of insecurity all over the country, uh, these are uh, self-inflicted uh, injuries. And I will give you one uh, very, very critical example. I have said it uh, and uh, identified two layers of insecurity in the country. I have talked about the urban banditry and also the rural banditry. The kidnappers, Boko Haram, Fulani Asmen engaging. When you look at the roots of all these two different levels of banditry and all that, you can almost trace it to the Nigerian politicians. They are, in a way, responsible for it. Take the hypothetical example of uh, your state. What is what happened in your state very um, uh, recently? Here is a young man like Makede who became governor. Immediately he came in there. He started so well, and all of us started embracing him. But we'll see what is happening in your state now. Makede, in a way, has torn on your state or taking your state back to the era of Lamidi Adedibu, in which the uh, woodlums and private families uh, take over the society, and in broad daylight, they keep terrorizing and killing innocent people. Just last week, two children, innocent children, somebody else's sons, were murdered in broad daylight. Well, how, how, is, how, is that, how is that? How uh, is that? anybody doing anything about it? But how is that? The, you said the governor is taking it back. How is that the governor's um, fault? I said he has taken your part to the era of Lamidia Dedibu. No, yeah, that's. I'm asking. You know how 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 exactly is he is he sponsoring? Is he behind any of these hoodlums that you have mentioned? Yeah, yes. Why do I say this? You will reconnect that uh, I have been emphasizing that you cannot be a politician of note in the country today without a private army. And what they will usually do is to convert any of these unions into their private army, give them protection, empower them financially, and arm them to the teeth to be able to cause me help uh, wherever they so desire. We have seen it happen when the PPP had their convention in the uh, Osho State, we saw people brandishing AK-47 in the uh, broad light. We also, like I said last week, how in broad light people were carrying AK-47 to kill uh, other people's children. And uh, after that happened, the children who were killed, uh, the relations of those children took their corpses to the governor's office. That tells you, and with the press conference, that some of the parents of these children have given that they know the direction in which these things are coming from. In fact, the person said that they can identify those who kill their children and that the governor is culpable uh, with, uh, with uh, those killings. But what excuse the, the governor has, he said those boys are called boys. And uh, even if people are called boys, the law does not give anybody uh, the, the power 
to go and take people's life uh, without taking them all through right. the, the, the due course or the legal uh, of the law. All right, quickly. And more, in addition to that, if you don't mind, uh, when um, the governor of Oyoste was going to form a motel, the news we got in the grave is that most of the people that constitute a third part of the recruitment to Amatepo. Why is political talk? And see the number of children that the Amatepo in your state have killed since uh, that organization started. Children oh, um, organizing cannibals, children organizing parties. Mr. Ah, Kola Ole, I don't... Um, can we can, just kindly hold on? Um, uh, these figures that you've mentioned, or these reports, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if we can verify some of all these things. And Amateko is not just in your state, um, also. Um, but I hope that maybe it will come up in a different discussion some other time and we can look closer at some of all these things. Um, I want us to look at something that might be a positive story in the, the news this morning, and that is the uh, second Niger Bridge. The government has said that by 2022 it will be completed according to their. Uh, projections. Uh, is that something that Nigerians should be excited about or celebrate? Well, it should be something to be excited about, but it is also a shame and blight on the Nigerian nation. Look at the number of years uh, that we have had just one single bridge across the Niger. By now, in my humble opinion, we should have not less than four bridges across the Niger for easy movement of the uh, people, goods and services. But lo and behold, we have never paid attention to the second, I mean, to uh, putting more bridges across the Niger. When we do know that the town like Onisha, the town like Inewi, and the town like Kappa are very, very important, very, very important uh, a business hub and the wealth creation center for the Nigerian state, uh, the impression one gets is that. Uh, some people uh, still want to continue to punish the evil people for the Piafra war that was fought uh, 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 long ago. Whereas, that ought not to be the case. If you say there is no um, uh, uh, vanquish and no victor, then you would have forgotten the past and properly rehabilitate people in that section of the country, integrate them effectively and fully into the Nigerian system. And one of the ways by which that could have been done promptly, swiftly, and efficiently is to have had more than two, three bridges across the Niger, especially because of the economic implications. And the hardship, one single bridge has been causing the, the Nigerian people. I hope the grandstanding that the second Niger bridge will be delivered in the 2023 is not a kind of a data or a reward for more than 5,000 young people youths that the ONAC have said the Nigerian army and security people have killed in the recent past. I hope that is not a compensation oh. they are giving the East uh, by saying that the second Niger bridge will uh, be completed in 2023. Okay. Um, Mr. Kolawale, lastly from me um, is a story on the Punch newspaper, and it's by the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development. Hadja Sadia Farouk. She said that the federal government has spent over $5 billion um, since 2016, that's in for about five years, to fight poverty in Nigeria. She also said that 7.5 million people have been pulled out of poverty and that, uh, you know, the president has invested in every sector, you know, every year. So um, from your perspective as a Nigerian, do you, do you know this to be true? Well, when uh, statistics um, they don't lie, and most of the statistics that we read that we get with regards to unemployment, with regards to poverty elevation and all that, are coming from a federal government institution. That is the National Office of uh, Statistics. And the statistics that are coming from those places is to the effect that inflation has gone up as much as 18.5%. And that poverty has risen uh, astronomically since uh, this uh, government uh, got into to power. And since the poverty and elevation program started, uh, the, 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 the number of people that have sunk into poverty in Nigeria have been reduced. Even though we see that billions of naira, we hear that billions of naira have been spent on a daily basis to elevate the Nigerian people's uh, poverty. You yourself can go around the street 
and see what is happening to the average Nigerian person. Women are now, uh, old women, you see them on the streets now uh, begging. You find the children leaving school to Oko and Hawk, uh, pure water, and uh, cola nuts and sweet on the street for them to be able to supplement their parents' uh, income. You also see uh, the farmers cannot go to the farm, and so the prices of food have uh, gone up. And uh, the statistics as regards all these uh, money transfer and what have you, uh, don't uh, uh, really tally, because even the 774 jobs they said they were going to create uh, about a week or two ago, uh, there was a lot of uh, rumpus with regards to the payment of um, uh, the so-called 774 people uh, that the federal government said they were going to uh, employ. This too, for some of these other poverty elevation programs. If the poverty elevation program has been effective, we would not have seen the uh, Nigerian people invade uh, COVID-19 warehouses all over the country and cutting away uh, most of those food items and other items uh, that were locked up in those places when not only they have uh, they have been distributed uh, to the average Nigerian person. So, uh, statistics don't lie, like I said. Uh, the statistics coming from the Federal Government Agency does not show that uh, the poverty elevation program of the Federal Government have been effective. Reconnect that even when the children were on the uh, uh, COVID-19 lockdown, the Federal Government was still declaring that was spending millions of naira feeding children that were in their parents' home that they don't know their whereabouts, that they don't know their locations and all that. The money that the woman in charge of the poverty elevation and disaster management is talking about is probably going to be part and parcel of the billion is claiming that they have spent to elevate uh, at the plight of the Nigerian people. I am not convinced that all of these things look like a, a propaganda. All right. To Nicola Wale, thank you very much for starting off our week uh, with us and, of course, uh, sharing your thoughts on these stories. Uh, we wish you a Thanks beautiful Monday. Yes, thank pleasure. you. All right. All right. We'll take a break here now to um, return with Today in History to tell you um, something about self-rule in a country and the unfortunate murder of three civil rights activists. Yes. Do we'll stay back. with us.